Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today it is all about an introduction to After Effects. Uh, last week, we started this brand new series. We're going to take you through all the fundamentals of working in, largely in Premiere and how Premiere interacts with After Effects and Audition and sort of a really large overview over the next couple of months of really digging deep and getting into fundamentals and all the things you really need to know to um, not only be able to use these applications most effectively, but also if you're coming to us from no film school, how to get certified so that you can then evangelize and teach these products as well. So to our viewers on the No Film School side, thank you so much for joining. Great to see you all here. I see we've got already lots and lots of people chiming in. <laughs> yes, Nigel was saying uh, an hour and 30 minutes away or one minute 30. Yes, one minute 30. Sorry for that. Of course, we're coming to you live across multiple networks. As always, Adobe Live, Behance, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. So great to see you all. A couple of quick shouts here. Nigel, I said, hello, Joseph. Joshua, great to see you. Pete Breen, good morning, good afternoon. Tun, great to see you over at your uh, brother's house watching. Thank you so much. Erland, uh, high point of every Friday. You are very, very kind. Joel Mwangi, great to see you as well. So you've got Rick Adams and Umicorn, Phoenix, Susan, Steve Kosaboom. Hey, so Steve, you know, um, Shark Puppet was going to potentially make an appearance today on the stream, but I've just learned that I think the Shark Puppets going to the movies, they have uh, spring break this week. So unfortunately that may not happen. Paloma, how are you doing? Wade Acuff, William Polk, Jurg, Mostafa, Theo, Theo. Great to see you all. Roman, RB, so nice. Multi-talented twin and Cody Bear, thank you for joining. Okay, so my friends, today, um, this is also going to be something which you're going to see over some of the subsequent streams that we'll be doing over the next couple of months. Um, I'm going to be bringing on and hosting a lot of amazing guests. We have incredible talent here at, at Adobe, um, many of whom I've worked with for decades. <laughs> and my guest today, uh, she is she is the one. She is the one that I go to if I have a question about After Effects. She is part of the product management team there. She's been at Adobe a very long time. She is an amazing human being, and I can't wait to bring her on to inspire you with getting started with After Effects and breaking the fear to getting into and becoming amazing at using this incredible tool, which is used across visual effects and everything that you see really virtually and probably every TV commercial thing that you see on uh, broadcast today. Hello. Victoria Nice, lovely to have you on the stream. Hi, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm so glad that you agreed to do this because as always, I love I love getting the chance to work with you. And for two and a half Likewise. years, we've only seen each other virtually. But um, I think in particular, you just have a really great style of teaching and inspiring. And you just know this stuff so well. And this is something I think I've said to you in the past. Even when you show me like new, super complex After Effects features, you have so much passion behind them. You make me believe like I can I can achieve them successfully with my sort of you limited can. abilities. Yeah, well, see, you're very yeah, inspirational. It's not so, scary. After Effects is not scary. Not. It, it works it's, a little differently than other apps, but it can do almost anything, but it's not scary about it. Right. And one of the things that I love to point out and always do is if you if you've used Photoshop, if you understand layers, if you've worked in Illustrator, you already know and kind of have an idea about how a lot of things can potentially work in After Effects. You have some concepts that are shared across all these applications, and that's really what we're gonna try and sort of nail down today and just get the starting process simplified and again, break that fear so people can get in and start animating and doing things and probably things that they never thought they could do just because they're, yes, it traditionally has been a little intimidating, but we've been doing so much at Adobe, right? To make yeah. it easier and less so. There's so Absolutely. many tools in there now to make it way more accessible. The in-app learn panel is fantastic. I think we're going to talk about that later. It's not yep. just tutorials. There's also assets in there that you can work with and experiment with. It, it's so much of it is just you want to just start playing around and seeing what's possible. Yes, so cool. OK, so we're going to get started. I want to remind everybody, much like I did last week. So again, today, this is introduction to After Effects. We are going through starting a project from scratch, going through preferences, talking about the basics of keyframing and the basics of animation and using shapes and shape layers. So again, I'm not gonna tell you not to watch. I'm not crazy. Please stay, watch, get inspired. Just come for Victoria. I'm always here, but please watch Victoria. But this is fundamentals. So if you, you know, if you're using After Effects daily too, and I see, yep, you've been an AE user 15 years, you probably won't see so much new, but maybe. There may be little, little bits. In fact, 
I already know there's a couple of things that are new to After Effects, Composition Profiler, which we're going to show, which a lot of users, many haven't even stumbled upon yet, or maybe they just didn't even notice that it's there. So you're going to learn something regardless. In any case, without further ado, I'm going to pull up your screen, Victoria, and uh, let's start from scratch. Let's do it. Let's start totally from scratch. All right. Yes. Um, let's, let's blank this out. I'm going to make a totally new project. Totally new, totally from scratch. So this is what you're going to see. Oh, I've done something here. My After Effects just did something different because I've set something up and this is a little bit more advanced, but I'm going to show <laughs> what I did so that I don't confuse people. There's a feature in After Effects where once you have your settings that you like, once you have your project structure that you like, you can save that as a project. And then every time you make a new project, it will use all of your settings. And so that's in the preferences under new project. I'm just gonna go in here and turn this off for a second because this means that my After Effects is adding a bunch of stuff that I like having there. I like having a folder for comps. I like having things all set up. Right. I'm gonna turn this off. It's here under new project loads template. Uh, this is the thing that I really like setting up because it, it's all those little things you have to do over and over again and you can save time by not doing them. And so let's now do a new project and it's actually going to blank everything out. So here we go. Yeah. This is what After Effects is going to look like when you first open things up. And yes. the heart of the whole product is compositions. So if you're coming from Premiere, you're thinking about sequences, compositions are the sequences for After Effects. It's just a bit of a language shift. And I'm going to click new here. And every single thing that I click is popping up on my other screen. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to make a new composition. And we're just going to do a simple title with some shapes and some text. That's the stuff that I, I really recommend starting with. Just play with shapes, play with text. Let's call this new title. And I have this set to HD, so 1920 by 1080. Uh, you can set your frame rate here. And then one thing that's different from Premiere is that compositions, unlike sequences, have a fixed duration. So I have this one that's 12 seconds right now. Uh, maybe I actually want to do five seconds. Let's make this a little shorter. So before you click away from there, because mm -hmm. I want to, I actually wanted to call that out and call out the little preset list of, of dimensions as well. So in terms of composition length, now this is something that you can always change after the fact. This is something that, you know, some people are like, oh, but what if it needs to be longer? You can always change it. And, but there's a reason why you also maybe start smaller because again, ultimately, if you're doing extremely long animations, depending on what you're doing, it just behooves you to kind of have an idea of the duration you're going for when animating, right? That's like you said, that's kind of a fundamental difference between you don't necessarily know how long the video edit's going to be when you do the cut down. But <laughs> for this, yes, you're you're sort of deciding up front. And the default, is the default like, is it seven or 10 seconds? I don't, or is Something it five? Like I don't even remember. It's, yeah, I know we change so our defaults. Since I've, since I've yeah, It'll, a clean installation. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I've had a clean installation of After Effects for well over a decade. <laughs> I was going to say, more than 10 years. And then the other thing to point out, too, is just the drop-down menu of all the various HDTV and all the different settings. Um, you know, I, I'm someone who loves to encourage people to look at the presets. Again, I think that breaks a little bit of the fear. Now, there's a lot of formats and things in there that are uh, esoteric. Good word choice there, Victoria. I don't know. Yeah, it Some where maybe you are in the world. It, and that's it. That's exactly what I was going to say. Kind of depends where you are. You know, we talk so much on my streams about 4K, 8K, 12K, BMD. A lot of places are still doing 720p. A lot of places are still really just kind of standardizing on 1080p. So this just this just gives you a sort of very broad idea of common composition settings. But of course, all of this is editable, modifiable, and I, you can even save your own presets in there, right? Yep. Yes, you can. That's Excellent. what this little button right here is. That's yep. make your own. Okay. Wonderful. Cool. So I'm going to click OK. And I've also set the black background color to black. Uh, and there's a few more advanced things here that we don't need to go into right now, but we might come back to them. OK. So I've set the background color to black. I now have a black rectangle. Progress. Right. We've got a timeline. We've got a black rectangle. A After Effects wizard. OK. No. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell <laughs> you, the first, yeah. time, the first time I opened After Effects, when I, I was a teenager, this was a very long time ago, there weren't those great big buttons there for new composition. Right. And right. I didn't know what to do. And I said, new project. And then I went, well, where's my timeline? I don't know how to do this. <laughs> uh, it is a different world now. There is so much more guidance. And, and this was, of course, in the days before YouTube. I had to ask a person what to do next. Right. What? No. Yeah. I had to ask a live human. Human? That what? long ago. Crazy. Craziness, right. 
All right, let's let's say this is gonna be a cool title, and I okay. did some stuff to my text already to make it cool. But I've just right. used the type tool here, and I've clicked and typed, just like I, and, if I was using Photoshop or Illustrator. Very right. similar workflow here. And just to highlight that up above, if you just look at the top of the UI there, you've got your tools panel, same same text tool that you've got in Premiere that you have in Photoshop as mentioned. And then you can see along the right there, you've got your character panel and ultimately you could bring up your properties panel to again, modify your text, use all of your uh, 18,000, or is it 20,000 Adobe fonts it's, now? It's but, a huge number. And it's a huge the properties it's, panel, yeah. but the properties panel is just in beta oh, right sorry. now. It's That's really right. great. And I cannot wait for it to ship for exactly anyone who's starting out in After Effects coming from another app. It's going to be familiar. Let me yes. just give a sneak peek at that because I am using the beta. Uh, and if you have access to After Effects, you have access to the properties panel because you have access to the beta. Uh, everyone has access to the public beta. Uh, this has all kinds of stuff in it. In fact, this is a sneak peek at something that's coming with type. But if I deselect that layer and instead I make a shape, I'm going to use the rectangle tool up here. I'm just going to draw a rectangle across my screen. You'll see that it's going to surface the most important stuff in my project. And so in this case here, I've got my shape properties. If I have multiple shapes, it actually lets me navigate through them. And I don't have to go twirling things open in the timeline to find my settings. If I want to change my size here, I, can, I don't have to go twirling down here. It's just right up here. So it's automatic. It's going to surface the stuff you care about. Uh, this is in public beta now. You can try it out. Uh, but this is not yet in the shipping release. So this is a little sneak peek at something that's coming. That's right. And for those of you who remember last week, I showed you how to access all the betas via Creative Cloud Desktop. So again, if you want to, uh, it's you just go to your Creative Cloud Desktop, beta apps are along the left-hand side there. But I'm telling you, and, and again, I'm so, I did the same thing last week because I'm so used to working in the betas too. I'm forgetting that that's not out yet. But yeah. That's the point. You get to is. see. Right, it is. Yeah. You get to see what we're working on, and you can give feedback on these things directly that the teams see. So, so we cool. I love. By you. the way, that panel too is it, where has it been our whole life? Right. Yes. Like it's we've it's wanted so to build good. this forever, and it's such a time saver, and it makes it so much easier to get started. Uh, but we yeah. really want feedback on it. We it, we've said we're not going to ship this in the final release until it's ready. So we need to hear from people who are using it. Uh, and the other important thing to mention about the beta is you can install it alongside the regular release and your projects are fully compatible. So you can go back and forth. You can try this out and then go back to the release build when you're done. Yep. So good. Okay. I All love right. The so we've panel. got text. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right. amazing. And I'm so we've got text and shapes. <laughs> oh, you're closing. Yes. All I'm right. going to close this. Otherwise, I would now do this whole thing with the properties panel. That's it's right. weird to um, have to take a step back. Because I'm like you said, I'm so used to using it already, and it, right. it's still in beta. It's still new. Right, but, but we're I'm... gonna go old school, old school traditional. All right, so I'm gonna name my layers. Okay. Important pro tip for anyone who's getting started: name your layers from the outset. I just clicked on a layer to select it. I'm gonna hit enter, and let's just call this blue rectangle. Right. There we go. Hit enter, and now I finally have a named layer. It doesn't yeah. seem like it's important right now. It gets really important when you don't have two layers and instead you have 200. Yes. Then it really yeah. matters and you're like, what is solid three? Right. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Which, very again, still guilty after 22 years. By the really? way, again, as we're at, I know, right? <laughs> as we're guiding our NFS viewers and our viewers on Adobe Live and elsewhere, if you're looking at the composition panel where Victoria's cursor is right now and you're seeing the layers stacked and you're going, well, how come I can't see the text? Because just like Photoshop, the shape layer is on top of the text layer, right? So it works in the same way. It functions the same way. The concept of layering here in the comp panel should feel somewhat familiar to you in terms of visibility. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it's Photoshop over time. Mm -hmm. And so yep. that, that's a good way to think about it. You have the same kind of layer stack. You can apply effects to your layers, but it's all non-destructive. You can always make changes, and you can then make those changes happen gradually. And that is where the real power of After Effects comes in. Yeah, and I believe that's probably where we're going to go, right? Ooh, Seems I was to be alluding to keyframes. Yes, a little keyframing and moving yeah. over time. So let's talk. Let's talk about keyframing. I'm going to give you a little bit of anecdotal info here for our viewers. I mentioned last week. If you're new from NFS, you're going to get a lot of anecdotal nerdiness. So I was just telling Victoria she knew this anyway, but I I learned After Effects about 22 years ago uh, from Angie Taylor, who's one of the goddesses yes. in the After Effects world. Angie is She's amazing. been Angie's amazing, and she. Truly sat face to, again, human face to face, 
we were at a trade show somewhere, one of my first ever for Adobe, and she sat me down and over a period of a couple of days and hours, we we worked. And the first thing we talked about were keyframes. And she talked about kind of the, the nature of animating and the five essential properties that you're going to work with that Victoria is going to talk about here, which are position, anchor point, rotation, opacity, and scale, which you can also remember via the acronym PARTS, P-A-R-T-S. Yes. It's better than apps row. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if you think about that, oh, and how do you access them via those same keys? Well, yes. virtually. So P for position, A for anchor point, R for rotation, T for opacity. Got to Important. give us that one. And S for scale. Okay. Carry on. And those are, I think, <laughs> the most important key keyboard shortcuts to start with. They are the yep. ones that I almost forget what they are because I've been doing this for decades. They are just built into my hands at this point. I think those and then hitting the U key to show anything that's been changed. If you got that down, that alone will make you faster in After Effects. But let's do yes. just position. So I'm going to just hit the P key here. And I have my, uh, we call this the current time indicator. Uh, someone, I once called it the time scrabbler, which I think is much cooler. Uh, right. and <laughs> current time indicator seems so formal. Very it's, formal. It's way too formal. I like time scrabbler. Uh, yeah. But I've got this at one second and there's no animation happening here. So you can see I'm dragging around and nothing's happening. I've just got a blue rectangle with some text hidden behind it. But I want to use this rectangle to reveal this text. I want to actually use this as a little animated transition in on my title. So first thing I'm gonna do is click the stopwatch icon. And you will see I now have a little diamond right here and that is my first keyframe. But if I move, nothing's gonna happen because I haven't made any changes. What that's doing is that's saying this value at this point in time. So now I'm gonna go back to zero to my beginning and I'm gonna just grab my selection tool up here. I can hit the V key for that as well. And I'm gonna just grab this and slide it straight off to the left. And I'm holding shift to slide it exactly straight. And you'll see now there's a line here and each one of those dots is a new position for this on a different frame. So I'm going from here and then over time that's gonna come in and land there. And if I hit the space bar to preview, you'll see that comes right in and lands and then it just sits there. So not that exciting just yet. We've gotta do a little bit more here. So I'm gonna then go, let's, let's go to two seconds here and let's grab the same rectangle and pull it off the other side. So now we've got an animation where it's gonna go from all the way from the left, land here, and then go off to the right. Now I can trim my type layer. I'm not actually gonna animate my type layer at all. I'm not gonna do anything fancy. I'm just gonna grab the end of this layer and drag that over here. And now there's no type at all hit spacebar, and now there's type. We've already made a transition with just a couple of <laughs> clicks. It's that simple. But let's get a little and fancier. Just, yeah, and just so everybody's clear, you literally just moved the layer position. So you're yep. just, you're just, you're just, you're not dragging, you're, you didn't trim the edge, you just physically moved the beginning of it, yeah. Yep, you can grab the edge like this. You can also right. trim layers. You can, right. you can stretch them, you can trim them. Uh, in this case, I think I did trim that, but I could have just slid yeah, the I whole couldn't, thing I couldn't over. tell. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So right. You can yeah. do either one. doesn't matter in mm -hmm. this case. Uh, and so you'll see, though, because I dragged it this time, it's now going off the end, but that doesn't matter. Those are, it's just off the end, and those are not frames you're going to render. So I've got my snazzy little intro here, but let's make this a little fancier. I'm going to select this keyframe here. I'm going to right click, and I'm going to turn this into a different kind of keyframe. I'm going to go down here to Keyframe Assistant and click Easy Ease. Mm. You can also press F9. And this the is the best kind of easing. Yes. <laughs> and it is, in fact, easy. So this is what's really going to give you your animation a much more fluid approach. And so now when I hit the space bar, you'll see that it's going to land softly in the middle and then speed out. And that may not be that easy to see on the stream, so I'm going to exaggerate this. I've clicked on my position property here, and that's going to select all my keyframes. And now I can click on the graph editor. And this is getting this is getting fancy. This is this okay, is the next a little stage. Fancy. Little fancy. Yeah. Yeah. And here you can see I've actually got a speed diagram. I could show my value graph instead, and you'll see that it's gonna slowly land here and then it's gonna speed out. And if I switch back to speed, you'll see that it's it's gonna get faster and then it's gonna get slower and then it's gonna get faster again. And the cool thing is I can edit this. So I could say, once I select this keyframe, let's let's drag this out. We want it to be really fast at the beginning. 
and really fast at the end. And I'm going to turn off my graph editor. I'm going to go back to regular timeline view and watch how different this is. Slow and then a nice smooth out. And so just by changing some of those handles, you can completely change the personality of the movement. All we have here is a rectangle and some text, but it's got some motion to it that has more emotion. It's not just sliding across and stopping. Right. Okay. And and that's a key, I was, that's not a key frame. That's, that's a key element of doing this is that, right, it gives you, it gives it some weight and a very sort of organic feel. This actually looks like half the titles you see in well yeah. done title sequences, right? That kind of movement, it, it, it keeps your eyes engaged. And it's just the difference between something moving linearly with no speed change, right? Um, and as you saw, when you go into the graph editor, which is, I'll admit even a little intimidating, you're, you're just tweaking Bezier's, yeah. Bezier handles. It's Super like simple, curves. again, you're, it's like drawing curves. You already know this if you're coming from Photoshop, Illustrator, it, it just kind of makes sense. Yeah. Let's do another one. Let's make another rectangle. Let's let's make this a little more exciting. Do a little more with shape layers. <laughs> We're going to change rectangles. it up. We'll have the other. This rectangle is going to go the other direction. I had a feeling. Yeah. Yes. All right. Do Love it. it. All right. I'm going to draw a rectangle here. I could also double click on my rectangle tool and make one that's the size of the screen. But in this case, I'm going to just draw this. Let's, let's just do that. Let's make it a slightly different size. Cool. This is This is what we're doing for variety today. And now I've got some controls up here. And this is stuff that in the future, I'm going to use the properties panel for this. But right now, I've got my shape options up here in yep. my tool panel. And let's let's change the color on this one. So we can make this one. Let's make this one maybe purple. That looks kind of nice. Uh, if I click the word fill, I can even make it a gradient or just turn off the fill entirely if I wanted to do a shape that's an outline and not a fill. Uh, you have blend modes in here. It's, it's a lot like Photoshop fill color options. Yep. So this is where my shape options live. I'm happy with just plain purple though here, I think, for now. Okay. So let's, like let's do some slightly different animation. Let's see. Maybe we want this one to come in a little bit earlier. So we're going to start with our center position here. I'm going to again hit P for position. I'm going to hit that there and go back to zero. I'm going to go back to my selection tool. We're going to slide this one off the other direction. Very edgy. <laughs> now, now here's another thing you can do. Maybe I want this one to just hold in the middle once it's slid in. I can just click this little button over here, and it's going to make a duplicate keyframe of whatever the value is at that point in time. Right. So right. in this case, it's duplicating this one because we're not moving once we're past, past this point. But if I made and that's key... really essential, right? Yeah, that's a really because I think that's where some people get. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's I think where people get tripped up is that they're thinking, okay, I get it. It starts not moving, and I want it to move over here, and then I want it to move again. But if you want that same, it needs to be in that same position before you launch again. Otherwise, it's going to feel like a continuous motion, and that's not what you're trying to do here. So yeah. really you know, important to. Exactly. Really important to hit that. And I do this in Premiere as well. Again, even in Photoshop, if you're if you've never used the the timeline, it functions exactly the same. And one of the keys is if you want that kind of stop, pause, wait, and then continue moving, or just before you do something else, set that position keyframe so that it's going to lock you in that same place before you move again or scale again or whatever it is. That's a really good point. And it, it, it yeah. really is exactly the same as the other apps. Yeah. And so now I've got two the same. And when I go ahead here, I'm going to push this off the other direction. This is going to hold in the middle. So watch this purple one. We've got the blue one coming in really nice slow motion, but this purple one is going to stop entirely. And it's not that easy to see. So let's actually make this a little longer. Mm -hmm. Let's spread these out. And you can see that just changing the timing on this is going to, again, change the animation behavior of the layer. So now we've gone from fast to hold and then fast again, because when you have to move over the same amount of space, but in less time, the motion gets faster. That's right. just physics. <laughs> right. <laughs> Love it. So that one's going to stop and then go out again. And again, we could ease those keyframes, soften that out a little bit. Uh, I, I tend to hit F9 to do this, but it is in this menu. Uh, there's other ways to do this as well, but I think this is the simplest one. Now we've got a hold and it's going to bounce out of the way. So a couple of people are asking, uh, Victoria, so what we have, of course, we have easy ease, and then we have easy ease in, easy ease out. So uh -huh. 
they're saying, what's the difference between That's me just different. using easy ease for all versus specifically if I'm easing out of a, you know, moving from a stopped position or slowing into a stopped position? That is a great question, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. It was one of the things that tripped me up for a long time. So I'm actually going to hit undo on this easy ease here, and I'm going to switch back to the graph, graph editor so you can see it. This is my speed graph now. It's fast, then it's stopped, and then it's fast again, but slightly slower because my timing is a little bit different. Now I want to make this a nice curve. So if I right click on this and I choose easy ease in, it's going into this keyframe has been eased. And then the same on this side, if I choose out, it's a little backwards because I think of it as ease in is being like that it's going to go smooth from there, <laughs> right, from that point right. well, to that Totally keyframe. the opposite. And it, it's right, it's right. a little bit backwards. It, this tripped me up for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, let me do this actually with something that's not set at zero where it's not moving. This will give us a clearer picture here. Yeah. So if I hit the same button here, I'm not going to get a duplicate of this key now. I'm going to get this middle point, which is currently one of these little dots. It's actually going to give me a new keyframe of that value at that time. I'm going to click that dot. And now I have one that's an in-between point. And I can start playing with this. And if I go back to the graph editor, right now, this is a continuous motion. And if I choose easy ease, it's going to go to zero on speed. But if I just choose in or out, if I choose in here, you'll see that that goes to zero, and then it's the same linear motion out of there. So this will have a really strange look to it. It's actually hard to see playing back because mm -hmm. it's just a few frames. Right, well, it's it's short. and this. again, this is where we could make it a little longer to kind of accentuate or, you know. Yeah, uh, let's exaggerate this. And to stretch those out, I selected them, and then I held down the Option key and grabbed the one on the end, and you can stretch your keyframes that way. Love it. So now we're going to have a really weird motion here. Let's watch this gonna slow and then it's gonna get a little faster right <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely has that like slightly again it's that organic Ooh, yeah. rubber bandy it doesn't feel linear it feels liquid I love this and uh, you know it's funny you're talking about the the confusion over ease in and out the way that I had to because I had the exact same confusion and the way that I've talked about it since then is easing out is like you know you're 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 revving up so it doesn't just go it just slowly kind of gradually it's it's your zero to 60 in x number of frames based on your how you you do it on the graph and the and the in is you're pulling into your garage you got to you got to ramp it down before you park right yeah. so you're kind of coming into that stop position very very cool very smooth it is such a fundamental difference doing those two small little temporal interpolations compared to someone who doesn't use those on their animation it really Right? It just it makes such a huge yeah. difference in how, how it just looks and feels. It's the first step to making stuff that really looks professional where the motion itself is designed. We talk about motion design as a right. practice, but right. it's, this is what when you're actually designing the motion. How do you right. want it to feel? And right. this is how you build that feeling. Love it. Love that. Yeah, what should we do next? Okay, so you know, now that you've done this, I was thinking... And again, we're going to kind of go a little bit advanced here. But since you brought text in, and since, again, After Effects has so many switches and buttons and icons, one of the most useful ones that I like to introduce early on is this concept of motion blur. Largely Ooh. because, again, now since we're talking about kind of getting away from linear motion with easing and keyframing, well, similarly, as things kind of come on screen, without motion blur, it kind of looks like the 90s, right? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes you want a flat look, right? Let's, let's do it on um, the shapes. We've got these two flying shapes here. Okay, let's do let's it. We can do it, it on shapes. Watch, yeah. Let's watch the before and after on this. We've got right now hard edges, just rectangles. As This is the motion blur switch down here. And watch what happens as soon as I click this. Suddenly we've Instant got this nice visual soft, change. soft mm -hmm. edge. And do you, have a good, do you have a good explanation for how, you, how do you define motion blur? Do you have a good like one-liner? Ooh, uh, it's it's the thing where when something's moving fast, it gets blurry, and right. the faster <laughs> it's moving, the blurrier it gets. And we can get a lot more technical than that and talk about uh, shutter speeds I and that it. sort of thing. That's right, right. Really, that's what I was wondering that. if you were going to go there. <laughs> no. Yeah, and, and that's it, right? And again, you think about something moving past your eyes. 
whether it's text or shape or a, a car in real life, as the car moves, you, you don't see everything clearly. It's kind of blurred because of the motion, because of the speed that it's passing you. If it's going one kilometer an hour, no motion blur. If it's going 140 kilometers an hour, right? If you were to take a picture of that with a slower shutter speed, you're gonna get this long trajectory of blurry car. Same concept here. And it's literally as simple as enabling that. But for the nerds- You can get fancy. You can get fancy. Let's oh, yeah. get a little fancy with the motion blur. Ooh, should we go in the comp settings? Crank it way up? Yes, yes. All right, so I'm gonna press Command K to open my composition settings. You can also do it a couple different ways. I can right click here and say composition settings. But this is when we were saying that we didn't touch advanced earlier. Now, if we go over to advanced, you can change these settings. And these are written in camera terms. Uh, and in fact, you can use this to get motion blur that if you're adding something to a shot, shot with a real camera, you can match things up and get something that's gonna really work with the footage. Uh, right. That's one of the things that's pretty cool. But you can also just crank this way up. And so if I change it from 180 to 360 here, uh, let's go back now. You should see I've got much bigger blurs. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> really soft blurs. You you can Love change the that. setting. And so now we have super soft motion blur. Love that. And that's one of the funny things is I've I've seen and again, nothing it's so it's always interesting for us at Adobe to see how people work because I've seen people use effects like edge feather, right? Yeah. <laughs> to to just place a kind of soft feathered edge to simulate motion blur because they just didn't know, how do I just turn this? I, I, there's gotta be a way to do it, but they couldn't seem to find it. So they're using actual blur effects. It's just kind of knowing where to go. And that's like with all apps. And I think After Effects yeah. just being so rich and having such a long, what, what are we at, 31 years now? I think 31? it's just about to turn 30 at this point. But there's right? so much oh, stuff in there. And as there, I just saw somebody so on Twitter much. yesterday said, like, I don't think anyone has ever 100 percented After Effects. I think that's absolutely <laughs> true. Right. <laughs> there's just so much in there. Maybe Dan and Dave. Maybe. 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 The creators. Maybe. You know. OK. I love that. Love that. Ooh, should we talk about parenting? Um, yes, and parenting is also gonna lead us perhaps into some pick whipping. So yeah. we're, we're now gonna dive, we're diving a little deeper. And by the way, I realize compared to last week's premiere one, you're, you're actually seeing more content creation. Part of that is because I love the way Victoria designs, but the other part is this is gonna give you an immediate edge because unlike premiere where last week, I, I, if you don't have those things set right, your editing experience is just not gonna be great. After Effects is kind of ready to go, but you kind of, if, if you've never designed in there, what do you do? So now you know a couple of cool tricks, how to do things like motion blur, parenting and pick whipping. These are, these are fundamentals that you need to know. And this is great stuff. And this will again, fundamentally change how you kind of navigate your thought process when designing uh, motion graphics and After Effects. So take it away, Victoria. Cool. Let's Some talk text. Parenting. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing really creative stuff today. <laughs> Let's say I really want this text centered on the top edge of this shape, but I want to animate them in off from off screen. Let's, we're ma making a lower third, let's say. I could just pick them both up and I could do what we did before. And so I could grab, select both of these layers, hit P, enable that stopwatch for each one, then go back to zero, select both these layers and drag them both off screen. So simple example here. I've made a very, very simple animation. But what if this is actually something way more complicated, that we had a lot more than just two layers? This is an advanced thing. There's a bunch of shapes. There's different text. It all needs to move together. That's when parenting becomes really powerful. And so there's a couple ways to do it. But what it lets you do is say, this layer is in control. These layers can still move independently. They can do their own thing. But there's one layer that's really doing the driving. So in this case, let's say we want this background layer to be the main layer here. And we're going to add, let's add some more text after this. First thing I could do is click this parent and link column. I could select this layer. And now my text is going to be tied to that layer. And in fact, you'll see something happened here. And this is the thing to watch out for. This is a trap if you're not careful about the order you do things in, <laughs> which is they're not moving together now. This text is moving off screen relative to this shape now because it's connected to this shape. So I actually want to turn off my keyframes on this text. And I can do that by just clicking the stopwatch. It's gone. Boom. No more keys. Right. 
So now they'll actually move together. This one's doing all the driving and you'll see that this is just gonna move nicely and smoothly. So now I only have to animate one property and I have this text and let's, let's, let's make some more text. More text. Let's make this text a little smaller. <laughs> We're making we're making something really stylish here. A designer after my own heart, Victoria. Uh, <laughs> more text. This text one can go more text. over here. All right, so we've got more text here. I can do exactly the same thing. So right now these things are going to move and they're going to leave that more text there. But let's let's say I want I want this to move at the same speed here. I can use the pick whip, which is honestly one of my favorite buttons in the entire app. And if I had a big stack of stuff, it makes it super quick. I can instead of going through this menu and being like, eh, which layer is that? I can grab this little spiral friend and use that to just select the layer that I want. And so now it's going to choose that layer as the parent and they're all going to move together. But I can still animate them separately. So if I look at the position here, this is now relative to this shape layer. So if I wanted this text to come in at a different time or let's have this start moving across the screen. I'm going to enable my position keyframe and then go to two seconds and let's, let's have this slide to the other end of the box. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing that's going to happen here is it's all going to move in together and then that text is going to be able to still move on its own. So Depending. parents and children, yeah. super powerful way to work and to reduce having to do things over and over again. Yeah. By the way, I believe it used to be a prerequisite, perhaps it's inappropriate now, that when you call out the pick whip and apply the pick whip and release it, Ah, yes. You have to make the sound. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see the animation. It does that. I love it does the, the recoil. It's yeah. so good. It does the Indiana Jones <laughs> recoil there. I just love it. I just love it. By the way, for those of you, again, new to After Effects, there are quite a few little, I mean, that's that's a fun thing, but there are quite a few little fun, silly things. I mean, I don't know if that's silly, but... It's there's, fun. there's it's, just, you know, engineers always puts, it does, right? The app itself seems odd to say, but the app itself has some personality. You're going to find a couple of those things here and there. There's one when, if, if a render should ever fail, you know, if that ever happens, yes. uh, if um, there's a particular sound effect that you may encounter, it's still there, right, Victoria? Oh yeah, the, sheep sounds not yeah. going anywhere. Sh <laughs> <laughs> if you suddenly hear a bleeding sheep uh, from across the room, you'll- Go check your render. Go check your render. Uh, but now, of course, now you have render notifications which That's you can true. send to Creative Cloud. So we actually give you you won't you won't miss it because we can tell you on your Apple Watch if uh, something happened or didn't. So Louis Valdez is saying, "I watch for the sound effects." Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Yes, we <laughs> <laughs> we try oh. and bring them uh, as often as we can. Speaking of cute little details, should we talk about our friend Oscar the Snail? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Read my mind. Let's, let's do it. All right. Okay. Let me grab a bigger project. I'm gonna grab a heavy project. I'm gonna grab our Pulse Benchmark project. Uh, this is something that you can actually go download from our uh, beta forums. There is a link on there and you can use this to test After Effects performance on your machine. This is a big heavy project because it is designed to use almost everything After Effects can do. Uh, but it's also a very cool project. It's really, really pretty. But you'll see here, I've moved to later in my project and I'm, I'm sitting here for a little while. And it's actually, I now have a new pop-up. This is the pop-ups in beta. It's going to point mm -hmm. to my little friend here. And that's, this is Oscar the snail, as in Oscar, go. Uh, right. Because we like our fun <laughs> here. Uh, Nerds. This layer Again, we're in the, we're in the bottom left, the if anybody's very looking. Very tiny where bottom the corner yeah. right here. Uh, and this took almost three seconds to render. And that's that's slow. And I'm like, man, this is, this is not going to be fun to work on if I have to wait three seconds for every frame. What can I do to speed this up? Say I've been given a project from someone else that's really complicated like this one. There's a lot going on here. I can click our little friend, the snail, and it's going to give me this new render time column. I'm going to skip the tour for now because this is what we're doing is the tour. Right. <laughs> uh, You're getting the tour. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hide uh, by the way, <laughs> the render time column is, is available now. You just need to right click at the top there where it says parent and everything else. And you can bring that in. The, the, yep. the little pop up is new, but the, this co the panel that you're seeing that's showing your the composition profiler that's in the actual release build as well. Just so they yes. know. Yes, that's a yep. very good point. And mm -hmm. so you can either click here in columns and render time, or you can toggle this on and off with the snail. But it's going to tell you how long the frame took, and then you can go through every single layer that's in your project that's active at that time. You'll see I don't have any data for the ones that are not happening at this time. Right. And I can figure out where that slowness is coming from. 
and looks like we have a culprit and it's that quick at a glance i can go ah it's this layer here slides footage that's what's being slow and maybe while i'm working i don't need that layer i could just temporarily turn that off it's going to re-render my shot and suddenly i'm down to 281 milliseconds which is a lot more manageable wow. so wow maybe I'll, I'll turn this back on when i get to my final render but now I can keep working on everything else I'm doing and I don't have to think about the thing where I have to wait for it to process every single one of those frames because those seconds add up. They really add right. up over time. And so this is a great way to see where you might need to optimize something uh, or also just what you can turn off to keep working on other things. Now, got a couple questions on the Adobe Live side. Some people are asking, so what what types of things is this, is this really? basically informing you about. So we haven't really called mm -hmm. out specifically. So it's large. Yes, I mean, you can have this with footage and keyframes of standard parameters, but more often than not, it's because you're using some kind of an effect. It could be a color effect. It could be any number of our or third party effects that are just a little more perhaps CPU or GPU intensive. And that's what's causing the slowdown. So maybe we could go into a little bit about kind of where where you're more likely to run into this. Because one of the things that we talked about last week with Premiere is some people are asking about requirements for your system, right? Mm. And as we standardize on, I mentioned, you know, of course, depending upon where you are in the world, but as we standardize even with our phones and devices on sort of 4K, there are naturally system requirements to just really have, a, again, a smoother experience. Yeah. After Effects works a little bit differently there though, right? It's That's a different true. concept of how, of how it really works with footage. And again, if you're animating shapes and text versus trying to animate 8, 8, 8K, uh, you know, um, alpha channel cutouts or something, there's just there's just a different level of overhead that you're dealing with. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as Premiere is putting things end to end and After Effects is stacking things up at the yeah. simplest level. Oh, that's great. And so yeah. when you need to stack a lot of things up, you have to think about what kind of system requirements you need to do that. I will, I will say, since multi-frame rendering shipped at max, uh, the more cores, the better. Uh, good GPU is always good, but you really want that balance between CPU and GPU, and then also yep. all the RAM you can throw at it. After Effects loves RAM, because it wants to put everything it's doing into the RAM so it doesn't have to do it over and over again, but you can keep iterating on top of it. So, so, so while we're there, Victoria, good. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could uh, talk a little bit about the sort of project panel and project settings and a couple things I want to touch upon. So first of all, um, the sort of bit depth and the default bit depth that we're working in in After Effects and how that relates to what they can see in project settings because, of course, After Effects, again, by default, uh, it's working in 8-bit, right? Yep. That's the default this setting. This is the default. Yeah. Now, we talked about ProRes footage, you know, iPhone 13 Pro Max are shooting in 422 <clears throat> Rec 2100, you know, greater than 8-bit. And if we're using After Effects and Premiere together, particularly with things that have, say, motion blur or gradients or, uh, you know, any sort of fade to black, you want to be aware of that setting because if you're, again, dynamic, and we're, we'll talk about dynamic link in a, in a, in a later mm -hmm. uh, stream, but you can use After Effects real time, essentially, unrendered with Premiere, just by dragging an After Effects comp into the Premiere Pro project panel. But when you render that, if there's a, if you've got After Effects at 8-bit, but you're working in greater than 8-bit in Premiere, which you always are, you can have some render issues in terms of pixelization and other things. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and talk to how we change that and set that. Yeah, the other thing to watch out for there is what kind of video are you outputting to? Right, and exactly. that's a key piece of this is how what's your bit rate that you're that you're going to because that can make a really big difference if you're working in 8 bit and then you're exporting as EXR you're right. going to lose some you're going to have information that you've lost that you actually didn't need to lose after effects is capable of keeping all those full colors and overbrights right. things like that uh, in this case here we're in 8 bit uh, partly because it's also there is a performance thing the fewer bits it's, it's going to be faster that's just reality it's processing less data. Um, right. I could go all the way up to 32 bits per channel. And then this is going to give me, like, if I'm doing glows and blurs, like really beautiful, bloomy colors uh, that you just can't get with only 8 bits. Uh, so right. this is the main place to change that. But that's when we also start getting into color management settings. And this is yes. something to really pay attention to if you're handing stuff off to collaborators working in other apps. This is how you make sure that stuff is going to look the same from app to app. And this can yep. get really complicated, really technical. 
Uh, but starting with your bit depth is going to be the most important thing to make sure that you're actually getting an accurate picture of your project. Yep. Yep. And again, as we mentioned last week, now with Premiere supporting more um, color working spaces, you need to be aware of this because again, I'm bringing in iPhone 13 Pro Max. It's not Rec. 709. So if I'm designing stuff in After Effects in Rec. 709 and I bring those two together, there's going to be a mismatch. There's weird. going to be, it's going to look weird and you're not going to know. To, oh, by the way, and just to call it out, how do you access this project settings panel? Ah, uh, yes. Little, the little uh, um, rocket bit. chip icon at the bottom. Is it a rocket ship? Yeah, there's a little rocket ship here and then the 8-bit yeah. per color yeah. icon uh, thing here. Both of these will pop up the same dialogue. It will right. put it to a different panel. So if I click the rocket ship instead, I get the GPU settings. Uh, right. And if I turn off my GPU and I set this to software only, I can say okay, and you'll see that my rocket ship has now got this little disabled icon on it. Right. That is a yeah. really great little troubleshooting thing for if you're like, wait, mm -hmm. why is this thing running slower? Because there's a lot of stuff that's much faster on the GPU. I think Lumetri color is like seven times faster. I was gonna say it's so like if you want to turn on your faster. GPU, unless you're doing something where you're working at like, I don't know, stadium screens where your frames don't even fit on your GPU, something like right. that. Generally, you want to leave this on. Right. Yep. And I'm we talked about that, that with Premiere too. It's super, super important. Also, just to reiterate, similar to changing the comp size after the fact, if you're designing and you need to be, say, in 16 bits per channel, you can still work in 8-bit if just kind of performance-wise you're feeling your system drag. But when you go to render, what you can you can change that at any point in time yeah. is what I'm trying to say. And if you're trying to check, say, you know, color density and, and again, looking at some of those gradients to make sure they look smooth, yes, you can momentarily switch into 16-bit and then switch back to eight and continue designing and doing your work. I'm curious if this project's going to look any different at 32. Yeah, I was going to say. Really. <laughs> not not <laughs> so much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't, it did look different. It actually, yeah. I lost some of the details here. You did, you lost details. Because it was designed to a different color space. Right. So this Super is, cool. It's important to keep track of that. That's that's a really good call out. Nice. Oh, we've got, oh, we've got Tun and quite a few others saying, oh, I didn't even know that. Awesome. Always learning stuff. things. I love this. Yeah. And again, those are those little things you may have stumbled upon, the little rocket ship icon there, which, by the way, just to the left of that is the new comp icon as well. So as Victoria Very mentioned, important. lots of different ways to create the comp, just like in Premiere. There's always multiple ways to mm -hmm. do similar things. But as you're kind of looking through the buttons and stuff, uh, click this around. Folders. Oh, and actually, thing that I was surprised to realize people don't don't know about because to me it's one of those things that's been there for so long I don't even think about it. If you want to import footage, you can drag things in from Finder or Explorer, yes. or you can go to File, Import, and choose a file this way. Hit Command I, but you can also just double click in the project panel, and it's going to pop up your import dialog right there. So. You could just double click. And that actually works in Premiere and it works in Character Animator mm -hmm. as well. Uh, this yeah. is a, like a standard Adobe video thing, but there's nothing to right. tell you it's there. You just have to find it. You just have to find it. And that's and I, I joked because as we're in the beta of Premiere working on this new import experience, right, which is very visual, yeah. I was the first to say I still double click in the project panel and basically use the finder primarily. You know, It's muscle memory. Um, I can't stop. It's, just, <laughs> it's muscle memory. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Very, very cool. Okay, um, so we've got about uh, six more minutes. So mm -hmm. maybe, Victoria, before we move on, and actually this is a great comp to do that, just nerding out a little bit more on some of the, the buttons and options in the comp panel. Mm. So again, where we have like, you know, fit to view, uh, this is where you can choose uh, uh, your, your, your um, for, uh, resol fractional resolution for playback, uh, setting um, uh, transparency grid. Maybe you could talk to some of those little switches down there. Because again, I think those are the things that if we don't talk about them at the beginning, they become, uh, I don't want to change anything. I don't want to mess yeah. anything up. And you kind of need to know what those things do. Yeah. And actually, we did a lot of work recently to simplify this toolbar. Yep. Uh, yep. This stuff over here on the right side only even shows up if you're doing 3D. If you don't have any 3D layers in your composition, you don't even have to worry about that. That just goes away. Uh, so there's half as much here than there used to be. And yep. anything that left this bar is now up here in this little menu here. Uh, we, we really met with a lot of users. We even had them build sort of their own dream version of this toolbar because there was so much stuff in it and everybody found it kind of overwhelming. And it was like just this huge number of buttons right in the middle of the screen. And you're like, what do they even do? Uh, <laughs> right. So we really streamlined that down. So now it's the most important stuff and it's actually been 
organized into a little bit more logical groups. So you've got first thing on the end here is how zoomed in you are in your composition. If I set this to fit, it's going to change the scale and show me what the new scale is as I move my screen and resize things. You'll see that that's going to change size. Uh, this is actually resolution for previewing. If I go to full right. resolution, it's going to show me all my pixels. It's a one to one of what I'm going to get. Uh, right. But if I drop down to quarter, it's only going to render a quarter as many things. I might get faster performance, but you can see here this is now much lower resolution. Right. So and like good I trick like if you're say, working on something heavy. Similar to the fractional playback resolution in Premiere, it's not you're not throwing anything away. It's totally non-destructive. It's merely to again, if your machine is kind of struggling along. I'll be the first to say, especially if you're doing stuff with, you know, pretty cool 3D or particles, you might not be able to get full one-to-one -one preview where you're feeling smooth doing it, all right? So a lot of times I'm yeah. just kind of in half res, my machine just responds better, but it's purely for preview purposes. Yeah, this is all non-destructive, all of this. Yep. That's a really important piece. And in fact, you'll notice this went up to more than five seconds here. Uh, right. This project is a stress <laughs> test and my machine is also live streaming. So there's that combo there. This is going to take a little longer, uh, but I don't want to wait five seconds every time. If I go back to quarter, now I'm at 563 milliseconds. That's a right. lot more manageable. <laughs> so very another, important. another thing so cool about the, the profiler, right? I mean, just to get that yes. like, oh my gosh. I love having that data. It's like, it, does this feel slow? No, no, this one's actually slow. It's supposed to be. We made it slow on purpose. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and then over here, I have my fast preview options. And so this is a thing where you can you can turn on some of this stuff. Uh, adaptive resolution will automatically reduce the resolution while you're working uh, if you hit something that's heavier. I tend to leave these off, but uh, if you're working on certain kinds of projects, they can be really beneficial. Uh, this one is, of course, your transparency grid. Uh, that should look very familiar from every other Adobe app. Uh, at this point, I want like gray square checkerboard fabric. Like I want a right. cloak, like I want a cloak of invisibility with that. Right. Um, then we have a couple again, other, sorry. I was gonna say, sorry, just for, again, for, for, new, for new users, think of it this way. If, you need, if you're needing to build something like a lower third, like sort of like the text animation you saw before, where that's going to overlay video or something else, you, you can have a background there, but you ultimately wanna see it in that transparency grid to see how it's going to look layered over top of something else, right? Versus if you had a solid back there, you wouldn't be able to see it. So that's why it's so nice to have that, to just understand the function of that that uh, that button there. Yeah, and I, I'll say when I was a motion designer, I delivered a lot of graphics where I was handing it off to an editor with transparency, with an alpha channel. And right. this is a critical thing to be able to turn that on and off because sometimes you need to yeah. be able to see what you're doing, but right. then you also need to have that sense of what does it look like with that transparent background. <laughs> right, <laughs> so cool. Um, there's a bunch of other things in here, like turning on grids and guides. Uh, some cool stuff. If we really wanted to nerd out, we could get into you can save you can save guide layouts now and right. share them. So if you're working like if you're working at a network where there's always a bug in the corner of the screen and you want to make sure you don't put graphics there, uh, you can create a guide preset for that. So there's lots of cool things you can do with guides and rulers. Uh, that stuff's gotten a lot more powerful. Uh, and then there's some fun things here for previewing things with different colors. So I'm going to go back to this project here. And let's go back to half res because this looks fuzzy. Uh, RGB, this is going to show me my, this is what if I render this today, what I'm going to get. But maybe I want to get a look at something in just the blue channel. I can look at just one of my color channels. Uh, and I can also look at my alpha channel. So if I go back to this comp that is transparent here, if I show my alpha channel, now I can see the black and white, what's transparent, what's solid. So it's a nice yeah. handy thing. If you're doing anything with compositing, you need to see if you've got clean edges. Uh, this right. is a handy thing. So I'm going to go back to RGB here. Uh, and then this allows you to change the exposure, which is really handy if you're doing compositing. So you can crank that up and down. And again, this is all non-destructive. Uh, so it really helps you see if you've got clean edges, if your colors blend together, if you're doing like green screen stuff and you need your subject right. to be the same brightness as the background. This stuff's really handy and you can click it to reset. But I think my favorite's the snapshot. I love the snapshot button. Uh, <laughs> it's just yes. a fun little button. It's waiting. Yep, yep. So I, I want to do some, I want to make some changes, but I want to see before and after. I want to decide if I like my changes. So I can click the snapshot button. And it makes a lovely little camera sound. Uh, we're talking about the the interface being fun, right? 
And maybe right. I want to see if I don't want this vignette or curves effect. I want to see what this looks like without those color effects. I can barely tell the difference. I turn them off. But if I now that I have this lit up here, I've taken that snapshot. I can do a before and after. And when I click show snapshot, I can see that there's a really subtle difference. And there is a shift in brightness there. Yeah. And so it lets you see that before and after. And you can secret secret feature, hold down option, and it will show you a difference, Matt. It will show you what changed. And that's so not cool. that obvious here because it's just a brightness change. But if I moved everything over, you'd see suddenly, oh, this is offset. So there's there's a handy little thing there uh, to do a before and after comparison. So I, I love the snapshot. I use that all the time. <laughs> So great. And unfortunately, Victoria, that is all the time we have. Um, Jim was just asking if you can play through the timeline, but you're going to have to wait till next time, Jim, to see, to see it all. Maybe we'll bring the render on the next AE stream. Victoria, I can't thank you enough for joining us today, for spreading After Effects knowledge to the world, to our new friends at No Film School. And uh, for everyone watching, of course, you'll be able to catch the replay of this right now, immediately, wherever you're watching this. So until next time, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we will see you again next time. Take care, Victoria. And Thanks. Take care, this everyone. was fun. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.